we have the privilege this week of uh, taking some time to read the Bible, this ancient word, and to listen to what God has to say to us. Because we believe that these words are living words. These are words that come from God that can teach us about not only who he is, but how he is at work in us and how he can be at work through us and in this world. And so with that in mind, I invite you to take a moment here with me as we start. We're going to read from Ephesians 1 in a moment. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for the fact that you are a speaking God. We thank you that you, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to us in these words. And we pray that these words would come alive in our hearts and our minds so that you would open our eyes to see you, give us ears to hear you, and hearts to believe what we see and hear. Will you do that work by your Spirit and for your glory in Jesus' name? Amen. So today we are continuing in a series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are taking a deep dive into it, and we are going to be looking again at, first, at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, focusing on another part of Paul's prayer. So let's read this. If you want to follow along, you do that uh, on the screen. You can do that in the link that's in the description below the video here. And you can also do that if you have a Bible with you. You can follow along there as well. So Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints." And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is God's Word. Well, I want to share today as I begin a story. Uh, probably, I was trying to figure out how long ago, I think it's about 14 or 15 years ago, I went on a canoe trip uh, from in Algonquin Park. And uh, as we began uh, one early morning uh, from Canoe Lake, if you're familiar with Algonquin Park, we start out in Canoe Lake, and we began, and it was the morning after a violent storm had ripped through most of southern Ontario, just an incredible line of thunderstorms the night before. And uh, not too long after starting out on this trip, uh, as we were heading away from Canoe Lake, uh, there was a father and two younger sons canoeing towards us, coming back in after their trip was done. And I remember as we came closer, we saw the look, especially on the dad's face, and he just, he was like white as a ghost. He just looked pale and still, I would say, in shock. And as we slowed down and we sort of said hi and tried to engage him a little bit, uh, he shared with us that they had been in that storm the night before in a little tent, and he said it was so loud, the thunder was so loud, the wind was so powerful, he says that the, the trees were shaking, the ground was shaking, they thought, he really was trying to quietly say to us, he thought they were going to die in that moment. It was just so powerful and so scary. And we encouraged them. We tried to tell them, you know, you're not too far from Canoe Lake. You're going to be okay. And it was very calm at that point. But you could see he was quite shaken up. And I'll never forget the look. I can still picture his face. The look of his face of just that kind of terror and awe and a mix of fear. It was just this, he had experienced something so powerful that he realized how small he was and how helpless in one sense he felt, even especially as a father with his two sons. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, where you've been in the midst of a storm like that or experienced something so powerful that you just felt like you were so small in comparison and that you felt like you were helpless before it. And if you have, then you have experienced something, I think that's important to experience at some point in life because I believe what we're going to talk about this morning in this passage and part of this prayer that Paul is giving for people that he's writing to is he's talking here about a power that's actually far greater than even the power that you might have experienced in the midst of a massive storm or in some other way. And Paul's praying that we would know this power, actually. 
It's one of the three big things that Paul is asking that God would help us to know. He's praying that we would know it. And the reason he's praying for us to know this in one sense is also because, as we looked at last week, when, if you were here or not, we saw that Paul began by praying that God would open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, to see the hope that is found in God and in God alone. And that hope is not some wishful thinking, as we saw last week, but it's actually a hope that's a confident expectation that God will deliver on the promises that he makes, promises for here and now and also into eternity. And it almost, I think, as if to anticipate the question was about how could you, tr- you know, trust that God really could provide that kind of hope? How could you know that God could actually be that kind of God to do that kind of work? Paul says that we need to know the hope of God, but we also need to know the power of God. Because it's only when you know the power of God and the God who is powerful that you can realize that your hope can be found in him. In other words, you need a God who's powerful enough to make the promises he makes come true. That he's powerful enough to change this world and all the brokenness and evil that's in it and to change you and to change me. That we actually need to see the power of God because he's the only one who has the power and the desire to use his power for good, a good to change this world and a good to change us. And so today what I want to do is I want to focus on that part of the prayer that's mostly found in verses 19 and 20. Next week, we'll look at the last part of the prayer and and see what he he has to say in the last part of verse 20 and 21 and, and following. But today, just focusing on this idea and understanding of praying to know God's power. And the way we're going to do this is by looking at three big points. One is the need for God's power, to know the need of God's power. Second, to know the use of God's power or how God uses his power. And then three, to know the effect of God's power. Okay, so the need for God's power the use of God's power, and then three, the effect of God's power. Let's begin with the need for God's power. Well, again, as we've seen over and over again in this prayer, Paul is telling us that he's praying for things that he knows we need. And it it begs the question, why do I need to know God's power? Well, because I need God's power to change me. But why do I need God's power to change me? What's so wrong about me? What's so difficult that I need God's power in my life? And there's two big reasons, I think, that we can focus on right off the bat, and that's these. One, That the power that we often do have, no matter who you are, at some point, if you have some amount of power, your tendency as a human being is to misuse or abuse the power you have. I mean, one author put it this way. He said, power is a poison well known for thousands of years. Power is a poison. It basically is something that when you get it, at first you might not feel the effects, but after a while it poisons you, it changes you. Uh, This is the reason why when we see power in people and then we see people who rise to positions of power, they often might start out okay, but over time, so often, power corrupts them. It changes them into people who use their power for their own selfish ambition and their own gain. I mean, this is one of the major themes in the Lord of the Rings series that you have, is that here's this ring of power, and no one dares to wield it who's of any kind of goodness because they know it will corrupt them. And anybody who wants to use it is going to use it for their own evil ambition to do damage and not to do good, to do evil, not to do justice. This is why we have the common phrase now that says power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is the reason why so many times throughout this world and throughout history, if you just take your time to read it, you'll notice that any kind of political revolution While it seems to promise always new freedom for those who are now enslaved, end up being enslaved to the new regime that takes the place of the old one. Because once they're in power, even though they might start well, they end up doing almost exactly the same things as the people who did before. Power corrupts them. And so Paul is saying we need to pray to know God's power because you and I, we are like this That you and I, no matter who we are, we are susceptible to have power corrupt us. And we need a God who uses power very differently than any of us ever do. We need a God who uses his power for good and not for evil. We need a God who uses his power to change us in good ways and to change this world in ways that are needed. We need to know God's power because only God can use his power to that end and in that way. 
What does that look like? We'll look at that in a moment. But before we do look at that in our second point, I think it's also to know that we need God's power. It's important to know that we need God's power, not just because we misuse it or abuse it when we get it, but also because if we're really going to be honest about it, we're far more powerless as human beings than we care to admit. Yeah, there are times where we have certain amounts of power, but if you even take the most powerful people on earth, whether it's politically or militarily, whether it's people who have power because they're in charge of massive companies or they have great wealth or they're very famous, they command attention, it doesn't matter who you are. You can take any person living on this earth today and there's something that will level the playing field no matter who you are, from the greatest, in a sense, in the world's eyes to the least. And that is this, that whoever we are as human beings, we are frail And we are susceptible to disease. And ultimately, we have one enemy that none of us on our own can defeat. And that enemy is death. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't cheat death. Death will come to every single one of us. No matter how old or young we are, at some point, we will face the reality that we are weak and powerless in the face of death. And as much as we try to ignore that or we try to fight against it and we do everything we can to stay healthy as long as we can, and there's nothing wrong with eating well and exercising and staying in good health. That's good. It's important to do. But the reality is, is that no matter how hard you try to do that, at some point, it's not going to work. And you can distract yourself from this truth and you can ignore this truth and you can try to just enjoy life the most you can and enjoy the pleasures of life as much as you can, just ignoring the fact that one day you'll face death. But the reality is, is that we all, no matter who we are, will one day face the reality of death. And we're powerless in and of ourselves to face it. And so Paul says we need to know the power of God because only God has the power to deal with death and to change us in a way that makes death no longer the final enemy. And that leads us really into our second point. Okay, if, if that's why we need power, then, then how do we know that we can trust that God is the one who has the power to do something about these things? Well, we can look at how God uses his power. And in the passage today, we see God use his power in a very clear way, openly, and also a, a, a sort of underneath the surface way that comes before that. And what you say, what do I mean? Well, have a look at verses 19 and 20 with me. This is what Paul is saying. It's a continuation of his argument from earlier on where he's praying that God would give us the ability to see him in new ways and to know him, not only to know hope, but it says here in verse 19, to know what is the measurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, these are massively Huge claims that the Bible's making. It's saying that the reason you can trust that God is the one who's all-powerful and has the power to change you and change this world is because he has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, before we get into how that changing us through the power of raising Jesus from the dead, we, before we get into that, we do need to ask ourselves this question that's, that's sort of implied in this passage, but it isn't overt. But we need to look at it, and that is this. Why does God need to use his power to raise Jesus from the dead? If Jesus really is the son of God, that's what Christianity claims, that he's God come to earth, took on human flesh, 100% God and still 100% man. If that's really who Jesus is and was, and he lived his life, why did Jesus have to be raised from the dead? Why couldn't Jesus use his power to not die? I had that question posed to me actually earlier this week by somebody who said, like, why wouldn't Jesus just live his life and do everything you need to do? But why, why does he have to die? Is he not powerful enough to keep from dying? He's God himself. How could he give himself up to death? How could he die? Why didn't he stop it? Why did he go through with it? And the Bible's answer, the answer that we see in this book of Ephesians and throughout the entire Bible, is that Jesus wasn't powerless. It wasn't that Jesus didn't have the ability to stop his death. He could have. He could have called down angels to rescue him. He could have done it himself. He didn't have to, in that sense, go through with it because he was powerless. But rather, Jesus, in all of his power, in all of his glory, in all of his might, chose to go through with it. That he chose, because of his great love for us, to go through a trial, an unjust decision, 
a death sentence that he didn't deserve, and a gruesome experience of suffering on a cross, all because what he was doing in that moment was choosing not to use his power to save himself, but in a sense to use his power to save you and me. That in that moment, what he's doing is he's saying, I love you so much that rather than use my power, which Jesus had every right to do, rather than use his power to judge you and I, rather than use his power to condemn you and I, because we fail to love God and fail to love other people, because we misuse the power he gives us so often, rather than condemn us as we deserve, Jesus chooses with his power to give his life in exchange for yours and mine. To suffer in our place. To be condemned in our place. To actually prove that he has a power that's so incredible. And that is the power of his grace and his love that he chooses to use in that way. So that we could be forgiven and we could be redeemed. We could be rescued. You know, what's interesting is I was thinking about this. Uh, I, I remember a quote from, from quite a while ago that I thought I would share with you. That, that shows you how different Jesus is in his use of power. And the quote is from Napoleon. Yes, that Napoleon Bonaparte, the French military empire man. And this is what Napoleon said. He said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. See, Napoleon understood something about Jesus and how different Jesus was than any other human, political, military leader. He knew Jesus had the power to do more than anybody else ever could have. And yet he saw Jesus using his power to love people and to rescue them, not to abuse them or misuse them. But if that was the end of the story, if Christianity ended with a cross and a death, then Christianity would be hopeless. There would be no reason to have joy or excitement about who God is and about Jesus at all. If it ended on a Good Friday, and it wouldn't be called Good Friday, it would just be the end And yet this is why Paul says that the end didn't come on that cross, but the end was made to be a victory because it says here that God worked his power, his great power, his great might, in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is the reason why Christianity is good news. That if you talk about Jesus and you talk about Jesus dying for your sins, that's important. But if Jesus stays dead, then there is no good news. This is why, in one sense, at the time of the Reformation, many of the Reformed leaders understood that we could not and should not ever depict Jesus as hanging on a cross any longer because he's alive. That Jesus is no longer in the tomb. That he's been raised from the dead. And that proves that God has a power beyond anybody else in this world. Because God used his power to raise Jesus from the dead. And that means that if we really understand Christianity. That we can have great hope in Christianity. To know that this God who has this kind of power. Not only raises Jesus from the dead. But proves that he has the power to change this world and to change us. This is why Paul is excited because he's saying, I want you to know the power of God because when you know this power of God, then you know that God has the power to change the world that we have in front of us right now. That one day Jesus will return and he will make all things new. There will be an end to injustice. There will be an end to suffering. There will be an end to pain. There will be an end to death. It will be no more because God will use his power to change this world. And there will be an end to the trial and the suffering and the pain that we suffer. Because Paul says that we would know this power. The power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Because this is the guarantee that you and I, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. That we too would experience this power now. And in the fact that he can save us from the dead. This reality that Jesus is the one 
whose life is putting on display God's power and how God uses his power is exactly why Christianity is different than every other world religion. Because in Christianity, God uses his power to save and to show mercy and love and grace. And then he uses his power to, to, to tell us once and for all that death, while an enemy, is a defeated enemy. And that death is no longer the thing that keeps you from God, but that it is only a physical death because he has healed the relationship between you and God. And there is a spiritual new life and a time where your body will be resurrected and reunited so that you can enjoy new life completely, body and soul, as Jesus did. Now, the real question that I want to deal with at the end here then is this. What effect does God's power have in your daily life? What difference will this make? Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe it's new to you. But what difference does it make that God uses his power this way? And I think I want to just focus on two things. There's lots that we could do, but just two things that I think would be helpful, hopefully, is to, to just think about and meditate on today. And that's these. One, that the effect of God's power, when we really believe that this is what God is like, that this is who he is and this is what he's done, then one of the things that should start to happen in your life if you're a Christian is that you would have a growing courage and less fear. That we'd have a growing courage and less fear. Now, what do I mean? Well, when you look at the early church and you look at people throughout history and the history of the church, that when people really understood just how powerful God is and that his power is for them and not against them, it causes courage to grow. It's not a courage that comes from inside of us, like we somehow make it happen. It's not a courage that you can manufacture. No, it's a courage that actually comes from believing that the God who made this world, the God who made us, and the God who uses his power to save us is the God who is for us and not against us. It's a courage that comes from knowing that you do no longer need to be wallowing in guilt and fear before God. Yes, we fear God in the sense that he is awesome and he is so much greater than us, But because you see that God is for you and not against you, then you actually have a courage that gives you the ability to look to him, to trust him, to speak with him, to listen to him, to have a growing relationship with him. That in one sense, you're growing your courage because you realize that the God who's made all things and the God who is all powerful is the God who is with you and the God who is for you. And in one sense, it's like having that dad beside you that you could say, my dad's bigger than your dad, and it'll always be true. That my God is bigger than anybody and anything else, and he's for me, he's not against me, so why should I be afraid? This is why Christians throughout history, even in the face of persecution, could actually have a courage that didn't come from ourselves, but that came from knowing the power of God, the power of God who is for you and not against you. And so this is a call today to put your trust in this God and to actually have a growing courage because you know his power is for you, not against you. But second, not only does it grow courage in you, but I think if we really understand God's power, this should actually increase our joy. Because when you realize what God does with his power, when you realize how God uses his power, he uses his power to do what? He uses his power to save you. He uses his power to show you his love. He uses his power to take you and bring you to himself, in a sense to wrap his loving arms around you, to hold you in his hands, and he promises he will never, ever, ever let you go. And here's the the, the thing. I think it's really important that if you want to experience joy in God and really knowing that he loves you, then you need to get the right image of God in your mind. Too many people, I believe, have an image of God where it's like, well, you know what? I know that Jesus died for me, and I just need to hold on to him. And if I could just hold on to him tightly, then I'll be okay. And he'll carry me through the storm if I just hold on to him. That's not the biblical picture. You're not holding on to Jesus for dear life, praying that your grip won't let go and that you won't fall away. No, no, no. The biblical picture is that you, in the midst of the storms and the difficulties of this life, and they're real and they're true, and Jesus said they will be, the picture, the true biblical picture, is that actually Jesus is holding on to you. 
that he promises to never let you go. That it's not your strength that holds on to Jesus. It's his power and strength that holds on to you. And he promises, you can read it in John chapter 10 and in other places as well. He says, no one can snatch you from my hand. He's not only protecting you and holding on to you so that even when you feel like you're letting go and you're falling apart, that he's holding on to you. But he says, nobody else can even touch you either. The devil, other people, nobody in this world, nothing can separate you from God, from his powerful love for you. And so in one sense, what you can have is a growing joy in your heart because you realize that you are so loved. I mean, just think about this for a moment. You have relationships in your life with a spouse potentially or with friends or with parents or with children and love and feelings of love. They're wonderful, but you know that we live in this broken world and love comes and love goes, the feeling of it at least. And, and even so, some of us have experienced broken relationships so much so that the betrayal just absolutely rips the heart out of you. And you lose all sense of joy and you're filled with despair when that happens. And yet Paul says we need to know the power of God because the power of God is a power, a powerful love. A powerful love that's so powerful that God in his power, in his might, in his strength is the one who reaches out in love and holds on to you and says, I will never let you go. I will never betray you. That's what Jesus is saying. I will never let you go. I will never disappoint you. You may not understand always what God does and why he does it, but he says, I promise you it's for your good. And you know it's true. You know it's for your good because he's reached out and given his very life for you. And when you experience that love, when you know that love, when you know the power of God in that love, that he will never leave you, never forsake you and hold on to you for all eternity, then you can have a joy no matter what your circumstances are. That you could have a joy in knowing that you are loved by someone who loves you more than anybody else in this world ever could love you. And promises that love will never, ever end, but will go on for all eternity. And so Paul is saying, he's praying that we would know the power of God. And in knowing the power of God and his saving love for us in Jesus and his raising him from the dead, that we can be assured that we can have courage and we can have joy in knowing that love and that power of God to change us and to shape us and to make us into the people he wants us to be. And so today, whoever you are, if you're somebody who is new to Christianity, you're listening to this, you're watching, you're, you're participating, then I want to encourage you to know God's power. And you begin to know God's power more and more deeply when you put your faith and trust in the one who used his power to save you to show you mercy and love in giving his life for you and proving that he can defeat death on your behalf by rising again from the dead. That you would trust in him. And if you are someone who has done that already, then I would encourage you that you might use each and every day to meditate and remind yourself on the love of God and the power of God in showing you that love. And one of the ways that struck me personally, I'll share it with you today, and maybe it'll be a help for you. As I was thinking about this sermon and working through it throughout this week, one of the lyrics from a song, and it's often for me, the, the words of the Bible do it, and also sometimes the truths of the Bible put to music do it for me as well. But one of the, the verses from a song called Is He, Is he Worthy um, by Andrew Peterson really came to my mind. And we actually played it before the service today, I think it was actually played. And Ben didn't know I was going to quote these, so... Wonderful that God did that. He spoke to my heart this morning through it too. And this is the verse. And I, and I think these words are ones you can meditate on this week if you want to. He says this, Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. And that's what makes him worthy. And that's what leads us to want to worship him, to enjoy him, and to rest and to be at peace in his powerful love. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, pray that these truths would not just simply be truths. But these would be the things, the realities that change us from the inside out. 
that for those of us who have never put our trust in Jesus yet, that today would be the day that in putting our trust in Jesus, we do experience your power, your power to change us, to rescue us, and to show us just how amazing your love and your mercy truly are. And I pray, Father, that no matter who we are, that we would see your power, your power at work to not only love us and change us and to forgive us and to hold us in your hands, but that you have the power to change this world and to change our lives and to make an end one day to death, to make an end one day to injustice and to evil and to bring in a new day, a new day in which we will celebrate and enjoy seeing you face to face and to rejoice for all eternity, beginning now and for all eternity, rejoice in your powerful love. Will you do this work in our hearts by your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. We like to take a a little bit of time after each of our sermons uh, and times in God's word to allow people to ask questions. If you're here in person, feel free to raise your hand if I don't see you and ask a question. If you want, you can text in your question or you can use the live chat as well. And we'll take a few moments and see what questions we might have today. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the Bible actually talks about it both ways. It's a great question. I'm going to repeat it. The question is, why does it so often, and it's most often, that it talks about God raising Jesus from the dead? Why isn't it Jesus raising himself from the dead? I mean, Jesus is God, right? Well, the Bible talks about it actually both ways. Um, The Bible talks about it here, as it says here, that God worked his power in Jesus to raise him from the dead. But Jesus himself talks about it this way in John chapter 10. I'm pretty sure it's John chapter 10. If it's not 10, it's chapter 11. But Jesus talks about the fact that he says, no one takes my life from me. I give it up of my own will. And I also take it up of my own will. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I have the power to lay down my life for you. And I also have the power to take it up again. So Jesus in that sense is saying, look, I'm God and I'm going to do this. I will be raised from the dead. And so there's this interesting both and, not either or, that God raises Jesus from the dead and Jesus himself says, I'm going to take my life up again. And so it's one of those, I think it, we chalk it up in a sense to one of those things that helps us understand that God is three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Father raises the Son, and the Son says, I take up my own life. And it's the Spirit, the same Spirit who worked in Jesus to raise from the dead is the same Spirit who works in us, which is quoted in another place that I can't remember off the top of my head. But there you have all three actively involved in the resurrection. And so it's a rather fascinating um, reality that, um, that we have there. So I hope that helps a little bit. It's a really interesting question. Thank you. Anybody else this morning? And if you find my other quote about the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, same spirit at work within you, if you remember where that is and you, you can tell me where it is, I'd be happy for you to, to let me know because my brain can't remember it right now. Otherwise, I'll have to throw it out later. Anything on the live chat that you see, Adrian? I don't see it either. All right. Well, let's take a moment to pray, and then we're going to sing our final song. And if you do have a question that's still coming in, I'll try to answer it then if I can after the song. But let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you that you are a good father, a powerful father. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the resurrected, powerful one who gave your life for us. What an amazing thing it is that you, the all-powerful one, would use your power to rescue us. And we pray that that would be something that we believe and that we begin to understand more deeply and that would grow in us a courage and a joy just knowing how powerful your love for us truly is. We do that work by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.